The civil war in Syria has left more than 100,000 dead, with more than a third of civilians caught between both sides of the conflict. Recent peace talks in Switzerland marked the first time opposition forces and the Assad government met face to face. But as talks conclude tomorrow, there is dwindling hope the country will see a positive outcome. Joining us now for more, here's Janice Stein, director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. And it is great to have you back in the studio, first time this year. Lovely to be here, Steve. Janice, I'm going to read something from The Economist from just a few days ago, and then I want your comment on it, if I could. Control room, please. The violence Mr. Assad has used has driven reason and tolerance out of what was one of the Middle East's most integrated countries. Well over 100,000 people have died and millions have fled their homes. The hatred is spreading to Lebanon and Iraq. The Geneva gathering cannot drain such an ocean of suffering and wrongdoing. It is built on the premise that Mr. Assad will relinquish power through a transitional government. But why should he? He believes he is winning. He is holding his own against rebel attacks or even gaining territory. Your view, Janice, how strong is Assad's position today? It's certainly stronger than it was even nine months ago, Stephen. It's stronger for two very different reasons. It's stronger because Hezbollah committed its forces on the ground to a ground battle. Um, urged on by Iran, and that made a real difference. It's the old boots on the ground argument, and it's Hezbollah boots on the ground. The second reason, very different one, uh, Assad is now the international community's partner until those chemical weapons leave Syrian territory. So the United States, Russia, everybody who made that deal has a vested interest in keeping this guy in power until that deal is done. He bought himself a new lease on life. That is fascinating because they've been obviously trying for months and months and months to get rid of him, but now you say they've got a vested interest in actually keeping him there. Absolutely. Until the deal. Until those weapons have actually exited Syria through the port, you know, gotten on the ships and are destroyed. Uh, he's the one that can guarantee the safety of those weapons as they move through the country, that they don't, um, in fact, end up in a malicious hands. And so he's there for at least until that deal is done. Do you know how long that will take? That'll take, a, uh, it, now we're supposed to be through by the spring of this year. We're already a month and a half behind schedule. There's another year at least involved here. So he's bought himself a year. He did, huh. more than a year. How would you characterize the, um, the nature of the talks going on in Switzerland between the two sides? It depends how low you can let your expectations go. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, if your expectations were very low to begin with, as mine were, then uh, Lakhdar Brahimi, the UN mediator, I think has done really well. And what has he accomplished, Steve? Uh, he's made sh he, I, I hope he's made sure that there's another meeting uh, a week from now. Other than that, the only thing that has come out of these talks is that the, um, the Assad team that is representing him in Geneva has agreed in principle that they accept the terms of reference which say, as you said in the introduction, there'll be a transitional government. So they are on course to have that happen? They've agreed in principle. That's different from being on course to have it happen. Here's what they're doing. They've agreed in principle, and at the same time, they're dragging their feet, they're advancing on the ground, they're reclaiming more and more territory, and they want to drag this out as long as possible in the hope that they will have extended the scope of the territory they control. So, to use a Canadian expression, Assad wants to rag the puck. Exactly right. Drag this out as long as possible. That's right. Iran was invited and then disinvited from participating. What happened there, do you think? Well, um, the Secretary General uh, invited Iran. He felt strongly that Iran should be at the table. So did Russia feel strongly. The United States obviously did not want Iran at the table. So this hung on. Do, do you accept these terms of reference from the Geneva One Agreement that this will be a transitional um, that a transitional government will be put in place. Um, so Ban Ki-moon slipped up here. He didn't press hard enough. He should have clarified that before he issued the invitation. But he thought he had it, right? He, he thought he, he thought had, he had it, it, but he didn't have it. But he didn't have it. And then when the United States insisted, well, I want, we want to hear the Iranian foreign minister say out loud, we accept these terms of reference, he backed off. 
and then Ban Ki-moon was forced to rescind the invitation. Not one of the glory moments for international diplomacy. So, no, but it, so it's a bit of a slap in the face to the Secretary General, but in yes. the long run, d does he lose a lot of face with serious consequences in the long run? I don't think this is a, you know, a, a tragic mistake with huge consequences, but ultimately Iran will have to be part of any solution that's discussed. Steve, they are providing financial assistance to the Assad regime. It is they that provide the logistics and the military support for Hezbollah, uh, and which make the difference, the crucial difference on the ground. It's very difficult to believe that when these discussions get serious, which I don't expect for at least a year, hmm. but when they do get serious, that Iran will not be part of the solution. Hmm. There are, of course, thousands upon thousands of civilians who are stuck in battleground areas. Right. So let me just clarify the numbers for you, sure. because we talk about this. We say, well, over 100,000 have died, and that's correct, over 120. But of those 120, our best numbers are about 80,000 of those are combatants, hmm. right? And the reason that's important it is not, now they're not wearing uniforms often, hmm. these men and militias, but they're combatants. As opposed to civilian civilians. deaths. So about a third of those who have died are actually civilians trapped in the fighting. Okay, let me ask you then about, you know, the, the, the civilians, women and children who are trapped in areas where there is combat and their existence is obviously very precarious. What undertakings are happening in Switzerland to try to get them out safely. That was front and center on the agenda in Geneva this week. In the city of Homs, we have thousands of people, women, children, and men, um, who the UN is telling us, the World Food Program is telling us, are on the verge of starvation, malnutrition, uh, because they have not been able to get access to adequate food and water for months and months. So. Uh, what Brahimi wanted was an agreement from the Assad regime, open up a humanitarian uh, corridor and allow those trucks that are loaded with food to go through and reach homes. What did the Syrian government offer, the Assad government offer? We'll allow the women and children to leave, and, but we want a list of the men hmm. remaining in the city to make sure they're not terrorists. Well, that is... Can't do that. We, <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, had they done that, I wouldn't give uh, anything for the lives. Right, it's a death those. sentence if your of name's course, on that list. it's a death sentence if your name's on that so list. So they turned it down, I They hope. turned it down, and Brahimi was not able to get a breakthrough, even on getting trucks through hmm. to a city that is starving. So no ceasefire, no resources getting through, these people Nothing. are still not in as dire of shape. today. Hmm. Not as of today. So that is, uh, uh, actually a serious disappointment. Even if some kind of political agreement were reached, how difficult do you think it would be to actually implement on the ground? Yeah, Syria um, is a broken society. You know, it's interesting to talk for just a minute about the difference between Egypt and Syria because those are two really dramatic stories. In Egypt, um, the, the, the revolt starts in Cairo. Um, and it is located in Cairo and spreads out in Syria, and it's, it's a homogeneous society, largely. Syria is the direct opposite. It starts in the periphery, way outside the capital. It's a, you know, a very segmented society, always has been, and gradually encroaches on the capital. What you're seeing, what you're seeing in Syria right now, Steve, is a society that's coming unstuck, where sectarian lines are sharpened, very difficult to see how you put this society together again, short of what Edward Lukeback would call exhaustion mm -hmm. on all sides, and we're nowhere near that yet. I want to play you some tape. Here's Michael Dorn from the Brookings Institution on pursuing regime change in Syria. Roll tape, please. A vacuum has developed in Syria. Uh, what we have in Syria now is a, is a struggle for regional order, not just a civil war. The Iranians are supporting Assad and uh, the other uh, major powers in the region, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, the Gulf states, they're all supporting the opposition. Uh, the United States is sitting on the fence. Now, lately, uh, 
a uh, doctrine has kind of taken hold, uh, uh, perhaps in the White House, certainly among many influential people in the foreign policy world, uh, which holds that the United States can work together with the Iranians to stabilize the region. But that simply won't work because it's a zero-sum game on the ground. Uh, the only way the United States can have influence over what happens there uh, is by taking a side. And the only side that we can take uh, is the side against Assad. Agree or disagree? Uh, disagree. I uh, disagree, one, that Obama uh, thinks that he can work with Iran on the ground. Uh, he's pursuing a single-track strategy with Iran right now. It's on nuclear weapons. I don't think he has any illusions uh, that that's going to make it easier to solve uh, the problem in Syria. So I think Michael's wrong about that. Secondly, um, he doesn't tell us how he wants the United States to take sides. The United States has already now stepped up, finally, military assistance to the Free Syrian Army, which is the smallest now of the opposition forces that are on the ground in Syria. Beyond that, any kind of regime change strategy which required Western boots on the ground would be a strategic blunder comparable only to the blunder that the United States made in Iraq. Well, you know Barack Obama is not going to be putting boots There's on the ground in no Syria. Chance. Zero chance. There's no chance, thank goodness, of that happening. Hmm. It would make an already terrible situation even worse. What about, as Michael Doran argues, that this is not just a civil war, but it's a struggle for regional order in general? Well, uh, it is both. It, but it's primarily a civil war. That's what, how it started, and that's what it is. And what you have in Syria is what you had in Lebanon in the 1970s and early 80s. Everybody in the Arab Middle East, in Iran, in Turkey, Russia, and the United States get in this game, arm and support their friends, and pursue their struggles at the expense of Syrian factions who fight and kill each other. Uh, in Lebanon, it took 10 years, hmm. uh, just as a reminder. So. Unfortunately, long game here. Very, very long game here with no obvious solution in sight. Let me quote Joshua Hurd from the New Yorker magazine of a couple of months ago, who writes As the international community attempts to steer Syria toward a political resolution to its deadly crisis, much of the focus has fallen on what it will take to sideline the extremists in the opposition and to bring the rebels to the negotiating table. But it may be equally difficult to convince the Alawites to let up their fight given that many of them fear a negotiated end of the war would be a prelude to their extermination. What motivates the staunch Alawite support for the regime remains poorly understood, but it is typically characterized in monolithic and myopic terms. The Alawites, it is said, back the regime because they are the regime. Its demise would be their own. But the Alawite support for Assad is much more complex and harder to break. So let me get your view on that. If there were a negotiated end of the war, what do you think that would mean for the Alawite faction? Well, who are the Alawites? They are 15, 13 to 15 percent of the Syrian community, small. And the pathology of Syria, like other regimes in the Middle East, is you have a small minority that has ruled a much larger majority. So, so 15 percent of the population with 100 percent of the power. Correct. So it's always looking over its shoulder. It's always mm. terrifying. And where are the Alawites? They are the commanders of the army. Uh, they're not the majority of the troops, but they are the commanders of the army. They hold every senior position of influence in the security establishment, in the intelligence establishment. So for them, the only way um, this can work is if they are given ironclad guarantees that their institutions survive, that there will be no massacres, that there will be a very slow transitional process. Um, that's not something that any, any, even the most moderate of the opposition figures right now um, are willing to guarantee, Steve. And that's why the dilemma that we face is, it, this is a really hard problem with no easy way forward. If you look at the three countries we're looking at tonight, I mean, power sharing and the elusiveness of that is a constant in all three of them, isn't it? It absolutely is. So what do you do about it? Well, what you don't do is insert yourself with military force on the ground into those kinds of fights, because these are family fights, and the most vicious fights in the world are family fights. Uh, there is one optimistic note, though, that I think is worth mentioning. Uh, if, you, if you watch the behavior in Geneva this week, 
the, the representatives of the Assad team, high level, I mean, foreign minister, ambassador to the UN, they really were, I mean, it was a really bad performance. Mm -hmm. They were out of control, uh, angry, um, you know, oppositional, quite vicious in their comments. Everybody expected an incoherent, fragmented opposition that couldn't get their act together. These guys had great media coaching. They subjected themselves to it. Polished performance, team players singing from the same songbook. That tells us something about a capacity of a very divided opposition. Uh, certainly on the political side, as distinct from the military side, their capacity to get their act together. Or they're unified in their hatred of the guy who's in charge. That's right, but they performed as a team and there was discipline in the way they behaved. That's encouraging. Gotcha. Janice Stein, good to see you again. Thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. Pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.